when the US FDA, for those who don't know, the FDA publishes announcements whenever they issue an emergency authorization for a new testing kit. How does a layman, a member of the public, or even a scientist scan this information that's released to find out how helpful is this test? Who's, you know, what what are the specific applications of it? Things of that nature. How how do we read these emergency use authorization documents properly? You just hit the nail on the head. I was actually going to bring that up a little bit. So an EUA, an emergency use authorization, typically comes to the FDA. And that, again, the FDA is a federal um, agency that kind of overlooks those types of tests. CDC plays a role in some of these things as well. But uh, it's quite complicated, Grant. So it's a great question. Um, If someone like me who has 28 years working in virology and public health and medical laboratory testing. You know, I've done all the education, I've worked in the field, I've got credentials, and it takes me time to sit down and look through those tests because there's so many coming out there. I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these tests that are out there on these lists. And then if you start looking at individual tests, as you may have done, there's there's more information um, they're, around. They're actually they're approving a new method that uses these two kinds of testing that does this and that. Absolutely, it's so complicated, right? So, I mean, my answer to that would be to be very careful if you're not versed in understanding how to look at um, a test insert. You know, all the information around it. We tend to want to see what the media or others like me. You know, you might push out something that says this is a great new test. It's been it's been approved by EUA. And so people immediately think, oh my God, this is the next latest and greatest test. But like, you know, anything, buyer beware. I mean, you really need to have someone look at that. Uh, if you aren't versed in understanding those terms, then seek help. You know, either it might be your physician or it might be someone that's actually a medical laboratory or a public health professional, because that's what we do. We bridge that gap between physician and patient. Because in, and physicians are amazing, but they have so much on their plate that they don't have the background that a medical laboratory professional has in testing and validation and clinical sensitivity and specificity and all the QC and QA that goes into it. It's a lot to, to deal with. So there's not an easy answer to that. So even having it on the public facing website, it's kind of nice. It's public. It's transparent. But it would be like me going and, and trying to interpret some some amazing, you know, engineering area that I have no maybe understanding of the terminology. I might have some understanding, but nothing that that's going to get me there. So, again, it's it's a tricky and, and complex world when you get into laboratory testing. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, testing in the laboratory is is so critical to a correct diagnosis and treatment plan, whether it's COVID or not. I mean, when you start looking at medical errors, you know, you really want to make sure that the correct person is working with the physician to interpret and order the correct test because one test may not work for a certain type of specimen. I mean, this is real simple. But for your audience, for example, there are some tests that you can only use for serum versus whole blood, or you can only use a nasal swab versus oral. And if you pick the wrong one and nobody knows, that's where medical errors begin. So it's you can have the greatest test in the world but it still comes down to using it correctly and having the right professionals run and set those tests up. Just so critical. I can't emphasize it enough. 